Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as Katrina said, my name is Dervin MacDonald. It's a real uh, pleasure and honour for me uh, to be here this morning with you to chair this uh, debate on the proposed extension of voting rights um, in presidential elections to citizens resident outside of the state. I got an insight uh, into how lively and vibrant this particular session might be when I climbed into my taxi this morning, where Dublin taxi drivers are always a good bellwether for many things, but uh, he said to me, Jesus, love, where are you going in your green? And I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm off to the Global Irish Forum to talk about um, extending voting rights. And it was a really, really insightful conversation um, those 10 minutes into the city centre, because he has a sister living abroad in the US for the last uh, 30 years. And he said, oh, you know, this could be a really, really hard one to call. He says, people outside of Ireland have a different view from people living on the island of Ireland. He also said, there's more people outside of Ireland than there is in Ireland. He worried about um, voting blocks. And I said, well, look, would you give your sister the vote? He said, no way. But <laughs> by the time we kind of snarled through the traffic, um, he came around to a different view. Because then he says, oh, well, no, if you're a citizen, you're a citizen. And you can't place any restrictions on that. Uh, he was a bit worried about Brexit and the granny rule and everybody kind of coming in, but it was just, just that, <laughs> that insight. And uh, he, was, he was worried about the North. He was a bit sensitive on that, me being a, a native Northern Irelander uh, on that. But, you know, we could be a very, very strong and I hope significant um, a participant um, in presidential elections should that uh, be carried forward. But it was just a really, really good um, insight. And by the time he got out, uh, I says, have you decided? He goes, I'll give it to them. So... <laughs> So uh, his sister, who's an Irish passport holder, uh, might be in a bit of luck. Um, <laughs> but I was something of a um, sceptic about the Constitutional Convention um, um, until um, I sat uh, and watched the deliberations of the Constitutional Convention um, in the run-up to the marriage um, equality referendum. Um, I was in a previous role then. I was legal editor of the Irish Independent at that time. Um, and it was absolutely extraordinary to see citizenship in action. Um, and having been very, very sceptical about it, I was kind of heartened by the deliberative um, process. The marriage referendum, however, was somewhat more straightforward than other issues that have come to be considered by the Constitutional Convention and in more recent times, the Citizens' Assembly. Because in the Constitutional Convention, uh, there were two things that happened in marriage referendum. Not only did an overwhelming majority of people vote in favour of the Constitution being amended, very, very helpfully for the government and for the state, they proposed how you would do it. So 80% or I think 79% of those who, who voted said it should be done by way of um, a definite uh, change, a directive amendment to the Constitution, that it should be allowed rather than a permissive amendment, that it may be allowed. And I think that that was very, very significant um, for, for grinding and getting public support for that marriage referendum because they just didn't, didn't just offer views on the what and uh, they offered views on the how. When you come to issues such as you know, the repeal, proposed repeal of the Eighth Amendment or even voting rights, even if you have a majority of the what and people are in favour and there's a huge consensus, I think where the tricky ground is going to be is the how and how do we implement it. Um, and I think that that is you know, what makes these debates, um, which in one sense you know, th there should be overwhelming support for, you might think, but when it comes into the technicality of the how. Um, so although we had a resounding vote in favour of uh, extending um, the vote in presidential elections to citizens resident outside of the state, it did... Uh, did throw up some interesting questions and diversions around the to whom and the how, and that's what we're here to discuss um, this morning. And I think that the discussion of the options and the eventual options that the government uh, brings forward will be critical to whether or not um, this referendum um, would be carried. So. Um, when he announced the decision, um, I was over in the States at the time uh, for when Tisha Kenda Kenny announced the decision to, to amend Article 12 of the Constitution, including to residents um, not just outside of the state but in Northern Ireland. Um, what Tisha Kenda Kenny said it was a profound recognition of the importance that Ireland um, attaches to all of its citizens, wherever they may be. And it's an opportunity for us to make our country stronger by allowing all of our citizens resident outside of the state, including our emigrants, to vote in future presidential elections. So will we be swamped? Will 70 million people be voting for less than five? Who should get the vote? Will it cost too much? 
And are we ready from an administrative and logic perspective to facilitate it? These are the questions. Thankfully, I don't have to uh, answer them because I have a fantastic panel uh, to do that for me. Um, what we're going to do, just to set out the objectives, we want to look at the decision. We want to look at the options, and we also want to maybe look at the operations and logistics. Isil Tonahan is going to uh, address you shortly from the UC School of Politics, where she's a senior lecturer, is going to talk us through um, each of the options, and then going to invite Senator Billy Lawless to make some preliminary observations. That will be followed by Minister Coveney, who has, as you've heard, taken time out from a really busy schedule to offer his remarks. But the real, the real debate here this morning um, is from 11 o'clock to about 11.40. That is your time. It's a time for the questions and answers. I would encourage you to really, um, really participate in that. And we'll wrap up after that with a, with, with, a, with a show of hands and maybe a vote on some of the options. So look, I'm looking forward to a really, really fantastic discussion um, this morning. Please do participate actively in it. And I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Isil Honan to outline the options. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm not now sure why I'm here at all, because Durable Taxi Driver has outlined the entire <laughs> gamut of the debate to you. But um, that take, taking that, and thank you, I want to thank the people who are organising this um, very much for asking me to outline the options um, for you. And I'm going to be very selective and brief, because I've only got 10 minutes to do this, and it might seem quite dry in parts, but I hope not too much. Democratic principles suggest that those who have the strongest claim to votes are those who are continuously and comprehensively subject to the laws and policies of the states so that they can have a say in those laws and policies. And that's been outlined in particular by the, sort of the senior political scientist, democratic theorist of the 20th century, Robert Dow. The authority of government and law, as we know, applies mainly within the territory of the state. But citizenship is broader than membership of this demos, the people who should be able to vote. Citizenship, Hannah Arendt said, is the right to have rights it's something of even more fundamental importance. And in fact, it's made up of a bundle of rights to do with protection overseas, as we saw in the session earlier this morning, the right to re-enter the country, full symbolic membership, as well as, usually, political rights. But it's also held by those who aren't necessarily given voting rights, children, for example, and those who are mentally incapacitated. So citizenship, and voting rights are not always identical and don't always go together. And we have to think about when it's appropriate for people to have vote. And indeed, some non-citizens have votes, such as in Ireland, resident immigrants, non-citizens have votes in local elections and so on. So equality among citizens is really important, but equality among citizens doesn't rule out differences in treatment where this is appropriate. So we need to think about who it is appropriate should have votes in different kinds of elections. But in general, the territorial reach of laws and policies implies that the core of the demos or the electorate should be seen as the resident citizens of the Republic of Ireland, rather than all citizens or anyone affected by the laws, anybody who contributes in some way to the country, anyone who shares national identity or common culture. This larger group must be recognized. But there are other appropriate ways to cherish the special affinity with people of Irish ancestry, to engage with the Irish abroad, and to acknowledge others who contribute to the country. And we've seen lots of them talked about over the last two days. At least I've only been able to be at some of the great sessions, but I, I understand all of the sessions have considered these things. Nonetheless, the contemporary movement internationally to extend votes to citizens living outside the state recognizes that some at least do have certain relevant connections and interests, and that they are subject to some laws and policies. They might be seen as stakeholders in the Irish state, especially in our globalized world. So democratic principles don't rule out votes for citizens abroad, yet this may be seen as a policy choice. They may get votes rather than a right or a democratic requirement. Now there are many ways of doing this. The political voice can be realized in different ways at different levels in different countries, and maybe is appropriately different in different contexts. It could be for some elections only, could be with separate representation or assimilated into existing constituencies, with different levels of access to voting through electronic, postal, embassies by proxy or having to return to the country. But it should be said that in all the increasing number of countries that have uh, external votes for emigrants and citizens abroad, um, very rarely do the ex does the external vote, is the external vote given the same weight as the internal vote, whether it's because of limitations on voting rights or difficulties of access to uh, exercising the vote. 
Now, here today, I'm going to focus narrowly on votes in presidential elections, because that's what we're faced to discuss, and more specifically in this forum on Global Irish, to, set us, to talk about the question of votes to emigrants and their descendants, citizens living outside the island, and to set aside the different issues that arise with respect to citizens in Northern Ireland. Now, I'm going to think about the seven options that were, yes, that are listed there, um, presented in the options paper. I'm going to group them into three for simplicity, through three groups. Uh, the first group, all citizens resident outside the state. That includes emigrants, descendants of emigrants, as well as the Northern Ireland. And um, that's options one and four there. Um, and uh, you see this in France and Italy, for example. The second option is, I take to, is that of emigrants, which I take as two, six, and seven pretty well clumps together. Um, and that's excluding Northern Ireland, but that's not relevant here. Citizens resident outside the state who've lived in the state at some time, what, we might, what I'm calling emigrants. Uh, and you find this in Sweden, in Germany up to 2013, and actually really after that, because now only special exceptions are made for people because they have spe special connections or knowledge of the German political system on a limited individual case-by-case -case basis. Um, and thirdly, emigrants with a time limit. That's citizens residents outside the state with, with certain time limits, and that includes options three and five um, listed above there. And in this, you find in the UK, Canada, Germany, Australia, and New Zealand, though in some of those places you can reapply to, to get rid of them. Um, so what are the issues? The principal issues arising, and I think everybody's aware of them now, is the question of the size of the external electorate and the genuine connection of voters living outside the state. In international law, the principle of genuine connection is seen as a reasonable basis for rewarding or retaining citizenship. So it tends to be seen as problematic if many people outside, eligible outside the state seem to lack a genuine connection, or if the votes of the citizens outside the state overwhelm or swamp the domestic vote. So people seem to recognize there is a distinction between, in the, the discussion from, between the, the domestic vote and the external vote. Now, in terms of thinking about what's appropriate to a particular place, the size of a country's electorate varies with three things. First of all, the extent of emigration from that country and the proportion of emigrants and their descendants relative to the domestic population. As we know, Ireland has a country with long history of emigration and a large population of the people descended from emigrants abroad. Secondly, the electoral law, which citizens you include and whether access to voting abroad is easier or more difficult. And the way that this interacts with third, the citizenship laws. If citizenship by descent abroad is liberally awarded, there'll be more potential voters. Some countries have more liberal vote extension by birth abroad, like Spain and Poland, some more restricted, like Netherlands and the USA. Ireland's citizenship law is relatively liberal because citizenship can be passed down indefinitely as long as births to citizens are registered with the foreign birth register, uh, births to citizens um, who themselves were born abroad. Um, and, but in, in Ireland, they can be registered at any stage in their life, whereas in places like the UK and Germany, it must be in the first year of life, and in Belgium, in the first five years of life. So we have a rather liberal uh, expansion of citizenship by descent abroad. And a highly inclusive electoral law can combine, compound a liberal citizenship by descent law in a country with large-scale emigration to give a potentially larger proportion of external votes. So is there a an issue of swamping. I'm not a demographer, I can't talk about numbers, but the options paper gives a number of existing citizens who may be able to vote and reckons that the possibility of swamping is quite small. But we also do need to consider the numbers of those eligible to vote, which are those people who do not have citizenship but are eligible through grandparents. We saw in the session just before the great spike in applications for passports, especially post-Brexit in Britain, which is expected to continue. So the numbers of citizenship abroad, citizens, uh, sorry, the numbers of people eligible for citizenship abroad is quite high. And while we might think that we don't resent people in Britain taking out Irish citizenship to retain citizenship of the EU, we might wonder whether they also should have a right to a vote. So there's a big question about whether citizenship and rights to voting ought to go together. And at least swamping is not a complete impossibility, though it may be very unlikely. 
It may be argued that the turnout is, unlikely to, is likely to be low, and it tends to be partly because of the obstacles are often put in front of migrants, immigrants in, in order to vote. <coughs> but in creating institutions, we need to provide for every eventuality. The experience of other countries suggests the possibilities of wider participation and mobilization of migrant groups under certain conditions, even though the voting preferences of external voters are more unpredictable than is often assumed. But it would also give a little, seem a little strange to give votes to people on the understanding that they wouldn't use them. It might even seem to devalue that right um, to vote. So, in considering the options for granting votes to citizens resident outside the state, Considerations of size and genuine connections of the voters need to be taken into account. For Ireland, the effect of the liberal extension of citizenship by descent abroad could be seen as weighing against granting votes to all citizens. Some third or fourth generation citizens may lack any substantial connection, though not all, and the numbers of those eligible in principle present some potential, if unlikely, risk of swamping. With respect to the post-Brexit interest in Irish citizenship, as I've said, it may be reasonable for people to be citizens, but not to have votes. And I might just mention there's a real problem. More people will be looking for passports since we've seen how nice those passports are. <laughs> um, secondly, there's the case of emigrants who've been born or lived in the country at some time. That's rather different. They're likely to have stronger connections and continuing interest in the country. In addition, their lower numbers mean that the risk of swamping is considerably lower if votes are granted only to emigrants rather than also to their descendants. And while there are arguments for time limits, and we should note, perhaps, at this point, that the Citizenship Constitutional Convention, majorities of the members supported giving votes to emigrants rather than all citizens, and supported a time limit in the exercise of that vote, although that support was sp split across options between five and 15 years out of the country as the limit. While there are arguments for time limits or voting rights, I, it could be said that the relatively high rate of return migration in Ireland would seem as militating against those time limits as representing continuing connection of migrants uh, with the state and giving some grounds for granting votes to uh, all emigrants residing abroad, regardless of time. And that's, I think, those are the three options, and the way we can group, group those seven into three options. Um, all citizens, all personal emigrants, and all personal emigrants, but with a time limit. And that, I think, that they're the decisions that people really have to take. Thank you very much. Thank you for setting out the options and setting the team first. I mean, you know, some opening um, observations or, or remarks on, on the debate. Uh, good morning, uh, Billy Lawless here, and I am really honoured to represent the Global Irish. We have a worldwide constituency of 1.73 million citizens. First, by allowing immigrants to vote, we have the possibility of creating a third historic opportunity to expand the franchise. The first expansion of the franchise came in the 19th century when Daniel O'Connell ensured Catholics got the vote. And of course, the second expansion came in 1916. At the core of the 1916 rising was a demand for equal rights and equal, equal citizenship. And as a result of the revolution, everyone over the age of 21, both men and women, got to vote by 1923. 1 1.7 million citizens voted. So the revolution was a success. Politically, we had become a more equal society. But in the intervening decades, Ireland has lost its way and has become a less equal society. We now have a three-tier system of citizenship. Voters in the Republic are first-class citizens who get to vote. Citizens living off the island are second-class citizens and cannot vote. And then there are, of course, the Irish citizens in the north of Ireland, several hundred thousand just over the border, who have Irish passports, but they are not allowed to to vote either. They represent the third class. As a result of this third tier voting system, Ireland is now out of step with the majority of its European Union neighbours and 130 other democracies around the world that already allow their immigrants to vote. In my opinion, 
our voting laws and regulations are no longer fit for purpose. Immigration has vastly changed. The relationship between Irish immigrants and Ireland has also changed dramatically. Immigrants come and go, and they are totally tuned in to what is happening here in Ireland. I believe this current three-tier system of citizenship is undemocratic, unequal, and does not meet the inclusive principles of equality that define the Irish Constitution. And the ultimate problem with this three-tier system is this. If you don't vote, you don't count. And if you don't count, you have no influence on the policies that have a direct impact on the millions of us immigrants living overseas, including those that create real roadblocks for those who want to return home. In my opinion, if you're a citizen, you're a citizen. So I was very pleased when the Constitutional Convention recommended that all Irish citizens be allowed to vote in the future for the presidency of Ireland. And I was very pleased that the Taoiseach took the next step and called for a constitutional referendum. So now we have to give our best advice to, gov to the government on the wording of the Constitution. I believe very strongly that we need to put forward a constitutional amendment that is inclusive and reflects recommendations of the Constitutional Convention. In my, uh, in my opinion, option 221 is the best option. It reflects my opinion that if you're a citizen, you're a citizen. You're not half a citizen, a second-class citizen, or a third-class citizen. And the most basic right and duty of a citizen is to vote, and that's what we want to do. Now, this is not going to be easy. We only have one shot at getting this across the line, to get the support of Irish voters. There is no guarantee. I mean, we all know referendums are historically a very dicey thing here in Ireland. <laughs> and we need to reassure and bring Irish public opinion along. And then we will need your help to do that. You have to mobilize the Irish immigrant community to use all of their connections back home to win the vote. We need to build on the work of groups around the world like VICA and get the boat to vote that have worked so hard to secure the vote over the last few years. The 1.73 million immigrants all have families and friends here at home and who need to vote yes on referendum day. So we need a worldwide grassroots campaign we need immigrants calling home and immigrants coming home by the thousands to help us win this referendum. We can make this happen with your help. I am also greatly concerned that the 240,000 young Irish citizens that left Ireland because of the recession are becoming another last generation of voters. Let's get these young people back and let's get them voting. It's time for Ireland to catch up with our European Union neighbours and the rest of the world's democracies and to modernise our voting system. It's time to give us the vote. Next year will be the centenary of women getting the right to vote in 1918 for expanding the franchise. I look forward to celebrating that centenary but also celebrate winning this referendum as well. Last night we saw a wonderful video on Ireland's bid for the 2023 rugby World Cup. The video ended stating, Ireland is ready for the world. So my question is this, is Ireland ready for us immigrant citizens? So let me conclude. I listen to all my colleagues in the Dáil and Shannon, and I always hear them complaining about the apathy of voters when they go door to door. Well, our, in my constituency, 1.73 million of them, <laughs> are Irish wherever they are, and they are passionate about gaining the vote. They care about Ireland, they love Ireland, they want the best for Ireland's future, just like all of you. So to the immigrants of Ireland, whether you're in London, New York, or off in Australia, now is the time to come together and get organized. Now is the time to at long last become first class citizens by winning this referendum. And to the people of Ireland, we say, Tour Dun on Vota, give us the vote. Gurumila Mahagat.
providing us with the understatement of the year that referendums in Ireland are tricky business. Um, <laughs> over to you, Minister Coveney. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Dervil. Uh, first of all, uh, Minister Joe McHugh, uh, thank you for all your work uh, uh, in preparing for um, for this session and indeed the last number of days. Um, senators who are here, uh, I see Mark Daly here. Uh, I see Trevor O'Clocky here. Uh, and of course, Billy Lawless here on stage, uh, who is as subtle as ever with his message. Uh, uh, and uh, to everybody else um, uh, who are going to be contributing to this, uh, to this session, thank you. And in particular, to those of you who have traveled to be here uh, and who I know have been advocating in this area for many, many years. Uh, can I say that I, I, I was thinking about, um, while Derville was in her taxi, uh, I was... Uh, I was having a cup of coffee this morning, uh, and I was thinking about my own circumstances. Uh, I'm one of seven children, uh, and six of us have lived outside of Ireland for a considerable period of time, either for work or study. Uh, I'm married to somebody who is one of 12 children. Seven of her immediate siblings are now Canadian citizens. Uh, and this is the Irish story. Uh, and uh, what you need to hear from government in Ireland now uh, is not uh, emotional reach-outs in relation to reinforcing that Irish story, which you already know about. Uh, what you want from us uh, is tangible evidence that actually we want to act on that. Uh, and that is why uh, I want to be very clear with you this morning. Uh, we have decided as a government that we are going to extend voting rights in presidential elections to Irish citizens abroad. What we are discussing this morning is how we do that and the, uh, the process by which we make that a reality. And that involves a referendum. It involves legislation. It involves committing considerable resources. It involves planning. Uh, it involves the setting up of a new <clears throat> electoral commission independent of politics in Ireland, which, which we need to do for, for other elections as well here. Uh, and so it's important that we have a blunt and upfront discussion as Irish people as to how we move from where we are today, which I think everybody in this room accepts is not an appropriate uh, way of electing an Irish president any longer, to a new uh, franchise whereby Irish citizens uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, in the UK, in France, in Germany, uh, in Australia, in Canada, the United States, in Buenos Aires, actually feel that they are directly connected and have a say in choosing who the head of state for Ireland and the Irish nation, if you like, beyond borders, actually is. And we are going to do that. Uh, the question, though, is uh, whether or not we learn lessons from what other countries are doing, and if so, how? Uh, and whether also we understand the complexities of having a successful constitutional change through a referendum to make sure that we get this done. Because as, you know, as Billy said, we, we have a once, uh, not in a lifetime, because I think if something goes wrong, we're going to have to fix it. Right? Um, but we want to get this right uh, now that we have committed to doing it. And I think, if I'm honest, you know, the very presence of Billy Lawless in the Irish Senate I think is also a recognition uh, in the current government supported by many other political parties that are here that actually we want change in terms of direct representation of Irish people who are living outside of, of the Republic of Ireland or the island of Ireland in terms of uh, the political debate that takes place here. Uh, and I am committed to that, absolutely, as the line minister who is responsible for bringing the recommendation back to government not on whether we proceed, but how we proceed. Uh, and that is why we have deliberately not proceeded with narrowing or choosing any one of the seven options that were published in the options paper until we go through a process of consultation. And this Global Irish Civic Forum was a hugely important part of that and is a hugely important part of that for us. Uh, I met some of, the, um, some of the people who were here uh, this morning uh, uh, informally, uh, who spoke about the need for, uh, for the option for further consultation uh, uh, after today, potentially. Uh, and I'm all for that. Uh, so 
Um, we do have time here. This is not going to be in place for next year's presidential election. Uh, and I think you need to understand why. We have to have a referendum. We have to bring forward legislation. Uh, we have to have a voter's register. And we have to put systems in place to make sure that we have uh, a new approach to voting that ensures the integrity of the system. And it is not possible to do that in 12 months. Uh, and believe me, I have tested our system because I wanted to do it, and the Taoiseach wanted it done for next year's presidential election. Uh, uh, and it simply wasn't possible to do that in time and stand over the process. And anybody who has been involved in referendum campaigns and the legislation around those would understand why that does take time. And we have other referendums that need to be held as well, and hopefully we'll hold a, a number of questions on the same day, uh, and we'll be able to accommodate this question uh, uh, as soon as next year, perhaps, uh, uh, in relation to, um, uh, to changing the Constitution and getting the people's uh, support for that. Um, so that's the first thing I want to say. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that, uh, in my view, uh, and my view has changed somewhat on this. Um, I produced a paper on this, um, I don't know, seven or eight years ago at this stage, um, working with a group of people in Brussels as to how we could extend uh, the uh, voting rights for presidential elections. Uh, and the conclusion we came up with was a little bit similar to one of the recommendations here, that people who had previously been on a voting register in Ireland should be able to register abroad again and vote in a presidential election. Uh, my view on it has actually changed somewhat since then. Um, uh, I would like to have a situation where what Billy advocates for uh, is where we go. Um, but I think it's important that people know that there are political risks to that. The kind of risks that, that Derville experienced in, in the taxi this morning. Um, Irish people are generous, but they are also cautious and risk averse when it comes to referendums. Uh, and if uh, if they feel that something is happening that they can't control or don't understand the numbers on uh, or don't understand the parameters around, uh, well, then that makes our job a little more difficult in terms of persuading them to make a significant constitutional change, which is a big deal for Irish people. We had eight referendums during the lifetime of the last government, and three of them were lost. So understand that. I know you do understand that, but uh, as somebody who was the director of elections for two of those, I'm glad to say we, that, that we got across the line, both at the time controversial, won a fiscal treaty, you know, trying to sell to people that we needed to support austerity at a time of real difficulty in Ireland wasn't an easy sell. And the second one was the marriage equality referendum, which actually was one of the most enjoyable campaigns ever that I've been involved in politically. It was an extraordinary time for Ireland and an extraordinary discussion in every household in the country. So this is something that we need to ensure is put to the Irish people in a positive sense. Uh, and that the questions that they ask about being swamped or being concerned about 70 million people potentially becoming Irish citizens having the option to vote. Um, uh, and that people who may scaremonger around those messages um, that actually we have answers to that. And actually when you look at the, the evidence where many, many other countries uh, have, uh, have extended voting rights to their citizens abroad, actually a very small percentage end up actually using that. And I think with the exception of Northern Ireland, that will probably be the case here too. Uh, if you have 1.73 million people um, people who choose to actually get onto a voter's register and choose to actively participate in a presidential election. You know, I don't think actually we need to fear um, that, um, that the, um, uh, the, the choice for, for, for choosing uh, Ireland's president uh, is going to be massively altered. It will clearly be altered. Um, Northern Ireland is a little different. Uh, and in my view, Everybody in Northern Ireland should be entitled to vote in a presidential election, full stop. Um, and, uh, and so whatever applies in terms of criteria, if we introduce criteria around connection to the country, whether that be having a valid passport 
which was one of the recommendations in the Manning report uh, in terms of Shannard electoral reform, uh, or whether it be linked to having been born in or having lived in Ireland for a period of your life, uh, or whether it be a timeline uh, since leaving Ireland in terms of showing recent connection to the country. Whatever that criteria, if there is a criteria, in my view has to apply to everybody on the island of Ireland as opposed to within the Republic of Ireland, given our obligations under the Good Friday Agreement and given the need to try and build an understanding and unity on the island of Ireland. Um, and so I think that, that does mark out people living in the north to be in a slightly different category uh, given previous uh, agreements that are legal agreements than perhaps people living uh, abroad uh, in other parts of the world. Um, so I just want to reassure you that I and government are committed to this. Uh, opposition parties are also committed to this in my view. Uh, Fianna Fáil have been very vocal on this, Sinn Féin have been very vocal on this, uh, the Labour Party too, uh, and indeed others and independents. Um, so our job in government now is to navigate a way forward that ensures that we have a successful referendum outcome and we, that we manage that and deal with any hang-ups that the electorate may have or be concerned about, some of, some of which were outlined uh, by, by um, uh, Derville and also Isolt, uh, whether, uh, whether or not being a citizen is the same as having an entitlement to be on a voting register. Uh, and they are le legitimate questions, given how open Ireland is to adding citizenship uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, connections and extended family connections to Ireland. Um, so I think, I'm not sure who said it, but uh, uh, there is a difference between emigrants and, uh, and citizens abroad in the Irish context. Because many Irish citizens abroad or people who are eligible to be Irish citizens never left Ireland. They were born abroad. Uh, and in my view, they should be part of the Irish family too. Um, you know, nationhood is very different now to what it was 20, 40, 60, 100 years ago. And actually, even though we are seeing our closest neighbor uh, and one of our uh, closest friends in the United States, politically, both turning towards a different type of nationhood now, in my view, which is not a good way forward. Uh, this is an opportunity for Ireland to do the opposite, to be seen to be reaching out beyond borders uh, and recognizing uh, and valuing uh, a, a broad Irish family uh, which lives all over the world now. Uh, and, um, but as I said, said at the very start, I think the days of an Irish government inviting people who care about and love Ireland uh, as Irish people and who make the effort to come to Dublin to discuss many of these issues, the days of us talking about uh, wanting to reach out to you and, create, uh, and connect, uh, connect in a closer way, uh, I think now to, need now to move on to an actual tangible result here on extending voting rights. Uh, the obvious place to start is with presidential elections. Um, and, uh, and that is what I am committed to doing uh, and I hope I'll be in a position to be able to bring a clear recommendation to government on how we do that uh, before the, uh, the dollar breaks up for the summer in, in July. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, can I just say there are many other people who are committed to this. Um, Joe McHugh has been speaking to, uh, to me about this since he um, took up this ministry. Uh, Jimmy Deanahan, before him, was passionate about this issue. Uh, many of you will know Jimmy Deanahan. Uh, and uh, in other parties, people like Mark Daly, uh, 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 who I know is here, have also been passionate advocates for this, as well as, of course, people like Billy, uh, who has spent, a, um, a, well, my lifetime anyway, uh, advocating, <laughs> advocating, advocating for, Irish, uh, for Irish interests and Irish citizens in the United States, but also... Uh, wanting to ensure that they have a, a tangible connection with, um, um, with their, their home country. So, look, um, let's have a blunt conversation and interaction. Um, don't think that this is some kind of plaw mossing and that this will just be delayed and delayed and delayed. We are going to act on this and we are going to put a, a functioning, credible system with integrity to make sure that it works in place 
for the presidential election after the next one. Uh, but we need to make sure that you're happy with that in terms of how we do it. Uh, and that is why uh, the, um, the consultation and the questions and answers session that we're about to get into now is so important. Uh, so thanks very much for taking the time to be here. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Coveney. We are, are going to move on to uh, the question and answer session. Um, there are going to be three roving mics. Um, if, if you are handed a mic, or just don't speak before you actually receive your mic, because otherwise uh, we won't pick it up. And perhaps if you could identify um, who you are and if there's any, if you want to direct it to the panel as a whole or to anyone in particular. Before we move, I just want to ask you, Minister Coveney, because as well as being the line minister for this, um, if a certain leadership race takes place, you could be in the front line of this debate. And I just wanted to ask you for you, um, obviously, Isolt has actually, actually helped us frame it in terms of options, but what do you think, in a, you know, in, w when phrases like diaspora, emigration, citizenship are, are interchangeable in many people's minds, but obviously have very specific meanings, what do you think will be the hardest yard for those who will actually get to vote on it, which will be the residents living inside the state? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what, what people will want um, who are actually voting in the referendum, as opposed to people who will end up voting in a presidential election, I think what they will want to understand in the question that they're being asked is, first of all, I think, by the way, there's an open mind to this issue. And some of us have tested this. Joe and I have spoken about this this morning. We, we, you know, we've tested this in public meetings and so on to see how people react, uh, as well as in taxis, as you have. Um, and uh, you even put on your green dress to try and get the right answer. <laughs> the, 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 um, what people say to me is, look, I'm happy to extend and support the extending of the franchise, but I want to know that the person who's voting has a connection with Ireland. Right? And, and I don't think that that is an unreasonable request, and I don't mean that in any kind of a patronising way now, but what people say to me is, look, is there any way of having tangible evidence that they, that they still have a connection and a love for Ireland. If they are going to have a say in electing our president, who will be their president too, well then, is it not unreasonable to ask them to have a connection? So, is that a passport? Is it that they've lived here for some point in time in their lives? Is it that they have left here in the last 20 years? Um, uh, is it that they were, were born in the country? You know, is there a tangible connection? Or, you know, as some people would say, and this is sort of to exaggerate for effect, you know, if somebody has never been in Ireland, um, may not speak Irish or English, uh, but may have a, a grandparent or a parent who has Irish citizenship and therefore they have rights to Irish citizenship, uh, should that person be voting in presidential elections? Now, I think that is an exaggeration for effect because in reality, nobody in that category, in my view, is going to, the trouble, going to go to the trouble of getting on an electoral register to be able to vote in a presidential election and probably no one in that category will even know that there's a presidential election going on in Ireland, right? But the point that's being made to me is that people are saying to me, we want to support this, but should we not have some evidence of a continued connection and care for Ireland as a country uh, in the context of, of extending this? Uh, and, you know, that's not an unreasonable question in my view. Um, uh, and... Uh, so my preference, actually, would be to simply give all Irish citizens the right to register to vote. Uh, and I don't think um, that, um, that that would mean that we would be swamped or anything, because I think actually the same people would end up voting as if we put some restrictions in place, because the restrictions would have to allow for people who care about and have a connection with Ireland who'd go to the bother of registering anyway, right? But... I think if we do that, we need to do it with our eyes open because it does become a little bit more difficult to sell it then in the context of a referendum. So are there things that we can do that can give reassurance to people who do who have those doubts in their mind about you know, making a, a link with, a, a continuing link with Ireland as, as we see it in terms of the home country uh, in order to ensure that a, a someone who is an Irish citizen also has a right to vote for the president. Uh, and really, that's what I'd like to get some feedback from. Uh, and, you know, lots of countries do this in different ways. 
whether it's Canada, Germany, and Australia, who have you know, timelines in terms of a period of which, uh, since which you left the country. Um, I know Isolt mentioned, mentioned uh, uh, France and Italy, who simply allow all citizens to vote. Ireland is in a slightly different category now to many of these countries, because we have a much higher percentage of our citizens living abroad. So, you know, if you're in a country that has 70 million people and you have a couple of million people living abroad, that's a very different discussion to if you're living in a country of four and a half million people uh, and if you know that there's 1.8 or 1.9 million people living in Northern Ireland who you're uh, extending a franchise to and you have another 1.7 million people living abroad, you, you know, you nearly have as many people living outside of the Republic of Ireland in terms of the geography of that country uh, as you have living in it. I think the options paper addresses that as a possible potential 3.6 million external electorate yeah. versus 3.2 here. 3.2. So, so, so yeah, yeah. It, it's potentially a larger electorate. But I think, you know, in truth, in this room, I don't think I need to convince too many people that if we extend voting rights to all Irish citizens, we're not likely to have any swamping effect, yeah. even though I think significant numbers in Northern Ireland will vote, and I think that's a good thing. But... When you're selling this to the country in a referendum and you have people who will be opposing that referendum and you have every media outlet in the country with a legal responsibility in their view to give coverage uh, to 50% uh, 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 of their coverage to advocating for a no vote as well as a yes vote, well then you need to understand that there are political challenges here that we need to think about when we actually frame the question here. Uh, that may make it uh, a lot easier to get this thing sold. And that is, that's really, uh, I think, the, the purpose of this discussion. Perfect. Well, we'll open the discussion up to the floor and great hands up uh, immediately. Um, what I may do, if, if the discussion gets very active, I may even take two or three questions at a time, but there are so many questions. Um, I'll take two from this side of the room and then I'll go over here. And again, just remind us who you are and, and uh, what you'd like to direct the question to. So maybe just start at the front here. Hello, Mary Minefish, Irish Business Network, Switzerland. So I'm just trying to think of a worst case scenario would, would be in relation to the people who are worried about the swamping. I was wondering what the criteria to become president are. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> must be Irish, must be over 35. Uh, I, I mean, that's, uh, I suspect that's one of the easier questions I'll have to answer today, but uh, you have to be over the age of 35. Um, by the way, we tried to change that, yeah. and the yeah. people said no. Okay, so just, I mean, you would have thought that if you go to the people and you say that actually the criteria to be president should be the same as the criteria to become a, a TD or to become, um, and that actually, you know, people who are in their 20s should be allowed to run for president if they want to, and it's up to the people. People said no to that, and they said no emphatically, like it was 60-40 or 70-30 or something like that. Uh, so that's a lesson. Right, uh, um, um, but yeah, look, you need to be you need to be an Irish citizen, and you need to be um, uh, sorry, you need to be living in Ireland, and you need to be uh, over 35. I, I, that's the only criteria I'm aware of. That's good. So I'll just move it on. Just we'll take maybe two questions from this side, and then we'll move over to the other side of the room. Thanks. Um, my name is David Burns, and I'm here with the We're Coming Back project. Um, my question to the panel is whether they're aware that there are 40,000 emigrants that are legally entitled to vote in next year's presidential election under Section 11, Part 3 of the 1992 Electoral Act, and whether they consider facilitating that vote uh, as a positive campaign for the presidential referendum, the eventual president for presidential referendum. Okay, that's excellent. I'm going to take the question behind you as well, and then we'll direct to so this gentleman here, and then I'll direct that. Thanks. Uh, Martin Collins, I was involved with uh, Irish and Britain and working on developing a diaspora policy. And I can say that when we started off, uh, it was a very, very difficult question to, to raise. But progressively, the more it was discussed and the more we dealt with the issues coming out of it, the people that had been involved in that debate were increasingly clear about what, what was needed to do and, and, and why it was important. So I think my question to uh, Minister, Minister Coveney or any of the panel is to say that discussion should be carrying on in the diaspora, that we have a role to play 
at this stage, not by voting in the referendum, but by participating in the debate. And so in terms of the planning for the, for the referendum when it's announced, there should be an element that sees how we're using the strength of argument of the, of the diaspora and including to different professions, you know, a really representative uh, sample of the diaspora of all colors, do you know what I mean? Uh, where, where they're from, what their personal situation is, and, and, and just building that up so that we are a part of the discussion prior, prior to the uh, Fantastic, referendum. Martin, thank you. I'm going to move over to this side of the room next, but maybe, um, Sandra Lawless, you might uh, speak to, to Martin's point, which was, you know, y your, your address this morning was very much even a rallying call to the diaspora yeah. itself yeah. To, to, to get out and take part in the discussion. I really think we got to be prepared uh, for the upcoming referendum because it is going to be tough. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Uh, I think we need to be all on the same page, no matter what country we, we're, we're living in, uh, for our citizens. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that uh, it's very much, they're very much in favour. They want to the vote. They're connected to Ireland. And especially nowadays, it's so easy to connect to all over the world on, on media and whatever. Uh, but we need to be on the same message, all of us. So I think with help from the government as well, Minister, uh, that we will have a package going out there that we can sell it to our people here in, our, 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 uh, our people here in Ireland. Because there, there will be sceptics. The swamping thing, we, we've got to nip that in the bud straight away. I don't see swamping happening. The actual uh, uptake uh, of registering to vote uh, can be, it will be very small, actually. And the number of people and in different countries at the moment, even in Great Britain, the last, uh, an overseas population of 5 million, there were 264,000 on the register eligible vote, only 95,000 in the last uh, election sent in, sent in ballots. And even with the United States, and they can vote in all types of elections, down to the local municipal council overseas, only 4% voters in, in 14 and 16. But really, um, can we assume that the diaspora um, will speak with one voice? What are the, the internal challenges, even with the, the, a lot of sorry, groups are, are represented here? Will there be even challenges within the diaspora coming out and, and speaking with one voice on the issue? Well, I've, there's also the other thing I've heard about uh, uh, no representation without taxation. And that's going to be another one brought up, but I can assure you. That goes back to the 1700s, the colonization of the United States for Britain. Uh, and, and they use it in DC as well. Uh, no, you see it on a number of places in DC, no uh, representation, no taxation. I don't buy that because no country in the world uh, puts uh, the, an onus on their citizens to pay a tax in a country if, uh, that, that are voting. And in this country, we have 880,000 people who aren't in tax, aren't in, um, yeah, in, in, in who, citizens mm -hmm. uh, who don't pay tax, are not in the tax bracket. Well, you know. in income tax. Income. Oh, oh, yeah, of course, uh, income tax, yes. I know they pay a VAT now, but, but the likes of ourselves, a lot of us here own homes in Ireland. We've been paying taxes for the last 10, when the, since the property taxes came in. Before we move to, I'm going to go to the gentleman at the back, but Minister Coveney, one of the most iconic things for me about the marriage referendum, and it was captured in, I don't know if any of you know the work of Annie West, the illustrator from the North West, but she captured the home to vote, all the young people dragging their, 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 their trolleys and all of their luggage back. But just to speak to that, you know, what are we going to do for those who are, are actually eligible, that extra cohort, uh, the 40K, um, how are we going to accommodate them? Yeah, I mean, just on the, I think we can learn some lessons from the marriage referendum. Uh, in terms of success, uh, because it was, it, it, it triggered um, uh, a conversation in a lot of Irish households that, that had never been had before. Uh, right? And it forced people to actually think about something that they hadn't thought about properly before. Uh, and they responded in a very generous way. Um, but, and I remember being very involved in the preparation, obviously, for that referendum campaign with lots of different disparate groups and other political parties who came together on it. Um, and there was a very deliberate decision made at the time that we wouldn't be demanding that the people change the constitution to give people their rights. Instead, we would be persuading and asking people to do it. And I, I would say that we need to take the same approach here. If people, uh, if we take the approach here that 
Irish citizens abroad demand that citizenship means they have to be give the given the vote. That then becomes a threatening message to people who have legitimate questions uh, and want to try and get their head around how you know, 70 million people are now potentially demanding a say in who our president is. Uh, instead, there is such a positive message to be, to, to be got across and such an emotive message, by the way, you know, my family and virtually every, family you know, every family in Ireland has emotional connections and family connections uh, in various different parts of the world. Uh, and it is that conversation, uh, uh, the, the kind of conversation that family connections delivered in the marriage equality referendum where people traveled long distances to come home because they were so passionate about it. Mm -hmm. I think that that is the kind of positive campaigning that will get this across the line. Uh, if, if this becomes a right issue, that people are demanding in the Irish constitution. My experience in politics is that Irish people will respond by saying, well, I'm not gonna be pushed to give anybody a right unless I'm satisfied that, you know, that it's the right thing to do and that people are actually making the argument for it as opposed to demanding it. Uh, so, so from that perspective, I think the, the diaspora will have an extraordinarily powerful message uh, uh, and, um, uh, during this campaign. Um, but it's all, it also means that the government needs to get it right too in terms of the sort of the argument and the armory that's there on the actual question that's being asked. Um, I move to the back of the room, gentlemen. Sorry, on the 40,000 so, yes. people, because yes. I don't want to be seen to be avoiding yeah. that question. Um, you know, that is, that's in the context uh, of people who've left Ireland but, have, but who are eligible to, write, uh, to, uh, uh, to vote because uh, they are, um, well, legally they're due to come back to Ireland within an 18-month period. Yeah. Uh, and I know you're looking for an extension of that timeline and yeah. we can look at that issue and tease those issues out. But that goes back to a legal requirement to be ordinarily resident in Ireland in order to be able to vote. Okay? And that's very clear in law. Uh, and so what that means is, you know, if you are leaving Ireland for a temporary period and that temporary period has been defined as 18 months, you are still ordinarily resident in Ireland if you're due to come back within that period of time. Now, of course... Ireland being Ireland, that becomes a sort of a, a flexible uh, 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 arrangement whereby, well, look, it was my intention to come back in 18 months, but, you know, uh, 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 and so, so there are people who are on voting registers who have been, who, who've left Ireland a number of years ago, uh, who actually could come back and vote. Uh, and, you know, I can't advocate for that because that's not legally sound, but I can understand why many people would want to use their vote in that context. And, you know, we, need to, we do need to think about how we can accommodate that group rather than asking everybody to get on a plane or, or get on a ship, uh, which is what had to happen in the marriage referendum, uh, to physically come back and cast their ballot. Um, but, I mean, maybe we can tease out some options on that later. I think that also for, for the, yes. Could I just add to that? Yeah. Is it possible, Minister, to extend that 18 months to three years, we'll say, in the short term? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, and I, like, we had a discussion on that since I know you, you, know, you raised it in a, in, a, in a press conference this week. Um, the problem with the definition of ordinarily, or, ordinarily resident mm. really does get stretched if you're, if you're out of a country for three years. Um, and uh, yeah. so, so we would have to actually change the law around defining that. And then that is potentially connected to the Constitution too. Right, right. Because, because all voting rights in Ireland uh, are, uh, uh, go back to being actually resident in Ireland and being eligible to vote in Dáil elections. And then all of the other voting rights are then linked on to that in terms of presidential elections, local elections, and so on. But it's hugely emotive because it speaks to, particularly to that recent um, yeah. Uh, yeah. wave of people who emigrated. This gentleman at the back has been waiting patiently. Thank you. Um, Jerry Malumbi, um, Ireland and its diaspora, uh, it's a blog I, I have, and I've been campaigning on this since before the Constitutional Convention. I welcome the thoughts that this is work in progress. Um, but... I have made a submission um, to, the, to the Global Irish Forum and I've favoured uh, option one on the argument of equality of citizenship. Um, I, my son Cormac has never lived in Ireland, but he has a connection with Ireland. He follows the sport and his friends are on Facebook and Twitter, dare I say, talking about being Irish um, in Britain. Um, so I'm advocating as much for him as for myself. And in terms of the connection, I have in my submission suggested um, um, that people would opt in 
if you are granted the vote as a result of the, of the referendum, embrace it, and the onus is on you to, to opt in. And even though you can be a citizen without, without having a passport, I suppose a passport is a tangible expression that you chose to be Irish or you inherited Irish um, citizenship. So my point is around, um, I know, sending it to the Irish people. I mean, I could have been, if I hadn't emigrated, I could have been that taxi driver. My brother says to me, Jerry, what's it all about? You know, and as the minister was saying, we have to sell it and present it. Um, but I am advocating um, for people who haven't lived in Ireland and yet feel and claim full Irishness. Thank you, Jerry. I actually had the opportunity to read your submission. There are so many show of hands. I'm going to take two questions from the front and the side here before we move back over to this floor, and I'll take them together. Uh, so that then we can line up. So just this lady here and then the gentleman uh, behind it and then I promise I'll go back. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, Mary Hickman, I'm chair of the Votes for Irish Citizens Abroad campaign in London and have been since 2011 when the campaign formed. And I just wanted to say today that uh, we really welcome not only the fact of the referendum going to take place, I sort of feel I can say the fact today, because I listened to the determination of the minister to bring this about. And we really welcome that. And I think we also understand the time scale. Having read the options paper, it, you know, it's perfectly satisfactory that the aim, as it's only going forward now, is 2025. But what I most wanted to say, following on, in fact, what Jerry's just said, is that if um, it's all very handily condensed the options to three, all citizens, all emigrants, or all emigrants uh, with a time limit. And I just want to say that the Votes for Irish Citizens Abroad campaign, and I do think other, or most other people who've been campaigning for this in the diaspora absolutely favor all citizens. And the reason why they do is it'll be a hammer blow to the global Irish diaspora policy if the vote for the presidency isn't for all Irish citizens. If we were here discussing general elections and referendum, we'd have a different opinion. But for the presidency, for the head of state, and given the last three presidents who've made such an uh, effort in their different ways to engage the diaspora, and in fact led, really, the Irish state in that endeavor, I think that would only be appropriate. And I understand the dangers as outlined, and I feel that the leadership of the government in putting forward the referendum, talking about the past economic contribution of em emigrants and their descendants to Ireland, the fact that the government put such great weight in the Global Irish pol Policy document on the uh, importance of the diaspora for Ireland standing in the world going forward, all add to the reason why it should be all Irish citizens to really engage and firm up the bond with the diaspora. But as my final comment is, it is of course perfectly reasonable to ask for engagement and evidence. If you're like me, born of an Irish parent born in Ireland, I am not eligible for citizenship, I am a citizen. I'm eligible to apply for a passport. If you're third generation, what you have to do is you have to not just apply for a passport, you've got to be foreign-born registered. That is a long process, requires at least uh, 10 different documents, uh, at least. In fact, I think it's nearly about 14. Having done that, you'd then have to apply for a passport and then you'd have to register to vote. That takes money and determination. And I hope that, and I think many people's determination would be there, but it, it is really um, evidence of the engagement of the diaspora, especially beyond the second generation. But for the second generation, who are citizens, that's Irish law, then a passport's a reasonable demand because they've had to put money up front, they've got a passport, they've given all proof of their antecedents. But I think it has to be put very, very positively in terms of the benefits to Ireland because I think it would be a real own goal for the global Irish policy if it isn't number one. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, this, is, this is certainly back. I suspect we need probably a separate day for a debate around the logistics and the methods and the cost and everything, but we'll just continue with, uh, with this gentleman here. Thanks. Hi, my name's uh, Kieran Doolan um, from Coltus, Britain, but for some reason it says Departments of Education and Skills. Somehow I've been employed since I've come here. 
But um, just, just before I start speaking, uh, do forgive me if I speak too fast, because I do have a Scouse accent. If you use slur words, then it becomes a bit I'm massive from here, it's okay. mess <laughs> for, for everyone to try and understand. But um, actually, I submitted my dissertation on this last week's Monday. So for the past sort of five weeks, I've been locked in my bedroom, sort of like just with a laptop, ramming down, reading the options paper, reading basically everything that's sort of like going about basically in the media and everything. And sort of like from my conclusions, I actually support sort of option four. And basically, but, but sort of the, the main issue that I found within, op, within options four mm -hmm. is the passport itself. Because basically at the moment, um, sort of like with Brexit happening, there's a lot of people who don't consider themselves to be Irish who are applying for Irish passports as a means to sort of like count to having to apply for visas and that type of stuff. But then whereas you've got fourth or fifth generation people in Liverpool who I know who consider themselves to be Irish, they can't access an Irish passport which they have to have a British passport, even though for them, sort of like, their relation with Ireland, it's sort of like, it, 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 it doesn't sort of like match their identity of who they are. But sort of like, I, I believe that sort of like the passport system has to be sort of like um, reviewed and sort of like changed in terms of who can actually ask, um, access an Irish passport, because in the front cover, it says the bearer is actually an Irish citizen. So sort of like the whole definition of an Irish citizen is within that passport, which is what I found in the government sort of like documents, is actually on that front page. But sort of from that, um, Obviously, so like in America, they have the American system in which, so like, you can leave a state and then basically move move abroad, and you can have a kid, you have a kid down there. That kid can then vote in the state elections and for the president. So in some states for local elections, so it causes controversy, sort of issues around around those types of things. Obviously, then you have the French system as well in terms of which it has sort of like it allows so like it has its own actual constituency um, part. Um, systems in the states obviously there's a french french mp or tz for switzerland there's one for portugal and spain depending on where the actual sort of like the, the population of the french diaspora are in the world but in terms of so sort of like the, the issue in terms of voting turnout obviously in the dutch case i think it was the last presidential election they had there only 17 percent of people are actually eligible to vote actually sort of engage with the process and obviously from my own personal experience of like people so obviously experienced in terms of allowing people in the north to be able to vote. Obviously, from sort of like being from Liverpool, we've obviously a very sort of political background. Um, obviously, go back to we're the, we're the only um, diaspora in the world actually has an Irish nationalist MP, TP O'Connor, for, for many years. Obviously, before that, that party became the Labour Party. But in terms of like m moving forward, uh, uh, I, do, I do think so. Like it, it neglects so the diaspora by not allowing us. You, you, you give us a passport and say, well, you're a citizen. But on the other hand, but you can't vote. It's sort of like it, it counter argues itself. But in terms of moving forward, I, I, I don't think, obviously, reading sort of like what Ender Kenny had said in terms of previously in the 1990s, he was sort of like going for, oh, well, you know, if you've been an ex resident in the, in the state and you moved abroad, then you should be able to vote. So, sort of like, I'm concerned about that because obviously it's, it's what defines a sort of like a citizen. And give, giving someone a passport says you are a citizen, but then obviously not giving them the rights of entitlements of being a citizen. And I think, it's I those think, types I think of what issues. your contribution yeah. probably does is goes to that the heart of that debate over those uh, different terms. Minister, I'll let you contribute before we go back to, to this side of the room. I'd like some comment on this passport issue because um, for me it would be a very powerful thing politically to be able to say to people in Ireland in a referendum, look, people who choose to hold an Irish passport wherever they are in the world, that for me is somebody who wants a connection with their country. Uh, and um, and wherever they are, if they choose to update and to have an Irish passport, that's a very powerful thing for me uh, in terms of helping to sell this and to reassure people. The, the problem with it, though, I suspect is, I mean, my understanding is that in, in some countries you're not allowed to hold two passports. Um, or your passport may be out of date and you may have issues getting it, uh, getting it replaced or whatever. Um, so I, I'd really be interested in getting a sense from people as to whether you think that would be a problem or whether you think that would be a solution. Um, because if you think it would be a solution, um, you know... What about Northern Ireland where people like me can... You know, well, I think Northern Ireland is a different category. Uh, you know, as I said, I, I, I think almost regardless of what we do here, uh, I think people in Northern Ireland need to be given the option to vote in presidential elections because they have automatic citizenship rights if they choose to trigger them. Uh, regardless of what community you come from I in the north. But, but I think outside of the island of Ireland, um, you know, having a passport, I think, is a really tangible thing. But I just want to understand, is it a problem for some of you to get a passport, 
to hold on to that passport? Does that trigger other problems in the countries that you're living in um, that may have issues with people holding dual, uh, dual passports uh, and so on? Yes, you wanted to come in there no, on that very quick point. I think yeah. that's a really important point about diff people having difficulty getting passports or the expense of getting passports and the expense of going through the process of foreign birth registration and so forth. Um, but I think we need to be careful that I think you could use passports as a kind of a piece of evidence of citizenship that would warrant voting. But, you know, there could be an incentive to get passports which would be different from the genuine connection, which for, for many people is the reason why they get a passport. Um, and people, you know, we know the stories about people across the world who live in countries which are not as trusted in the world as Ireland is, who have eligibility to Irish passports um, and who take out Irish citizenship as a means of easy travel around the world. And that's just one example. So, I think on the one hand, passports could be a good way of evidence that you are a citizen, but making it the criterion for voting can be both over-inclusive and under-inclusive for the people who have problems that Simon Coveney has asked. Okay, we're going to take about three questions or contributions just in quick succession because we are under some time pressure. So just this gentleman in the white, the lady in the red, and uh, just this gentleman here. If we take um, your questions all ruddily, uh, we can put them to the panel. Thanks. Hello, yeah, my name is Conrad Bryan. I'm from Irish and Britain. Um, I really welcome this commitment by the government to give us the right to vote uh, in, in elections. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, um, having left Ireland 25 years, it's a wonderful to feel that people at home in Ireland are starting to sort of give us that opportunity to, to, to bring forward. I guess the question for me is in terms of, when I think of this, the decision to allow us to have a vote, it's going to be made by people in the Republic of Ireland. And I think that's something we need to be very conscious about uh, in terms of how do we bring this vote across the line? What do we need to do in the diaspora to get across the actual commitment that we have to Ireland, the work that we do, the times we go back home, the business connections, the remittances, there's so many great stories out there in the diaspora that we need to get, get home. Um, and I guess, is how do we get that message across? What are the avenues we need to use, whether it's media, uh, I'm not sure, but I think, Billy, you probably like this. I think perhaps an opportunity, given, given that it's gonna be another eight years before we actually realize this, this uh, goal, uh, is it worth us having another uh, diaspora senator? Would the other political parties show a commitment by saying, well, look, we can't give you the presidential vote, but we'd like to have another diaspora senator. Maybe a few more Billy Lawlesses, one representing Euro Europe, <laughs> one representing Australia, I think would be a good idea. Thank you. Now, this lady in, the, in red. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take them all together. Before um, hi, my name is um, Sally Mulready. Um, I've worked in London um, oh, for decades with, with the Irish community, uh, and I'm also privileged to have been nominated by um, President Michael D uh, on his Council of State. Um, I, I want to say, uh, to echo what uh, Professor Mary Hickman said earlier, um, and, and also to pay tribute to Mary Hickman for the huge amount of work that she has done on this since 2011, um, I, on, on all of our behalf. Um, what I wanted to say to the two ministers is thanks and thanks again for the huge commitment that you've both indicated here today. Um, it, it, it's really, really, really uh, kind of for us, really, you can't believe you're here after all these years of campaigning for this. Um, but what I would say is, in terms of the all party agreement on this, um, I'm not at all convinced that there's unity and all party agreement. And I think it needs to be demonstrated a lot stronger than it is. It's certainly in, in relation to both of you and your party, it is very clear. But um, I, I am concerned that that all party um, resolve isn't as strong as it could be. So that's, you know, if there are other um, political parties here. Um, the other point I wanted to make was in relation to, I mean, I see option three up there and I just think, oh my God, I hope that there will never be age limits or time limits. Um, I work with older Irish people, and I've done that for two or three decades now. Um, that's the generation that really are looking, you know, to see what's going to happen here. But obviously, sadly, um, it's not going to happen in their lifetime, but that's not going to stop them campaigning 
for future generations. Um, and I think it's really important that we consider the, tribute, consider the um, contribution of the older Irish community. Um, they've remained faithful to Ireland, their emigrant remittances are legendary, and all the other reasons that we all already know about the contribution of older Irish people. And I hope that we would, um, in terms of the referendum and the uh, discussion and the debate and the whole next five years, that, that you know, their contribution is, is not forgotten. Um, in terms of the referendum itself, um, I mean, I, I, I'd love to get a copy of your speech, Billy, because um, in it lies all the kind of tones and moods that that referendum the content of that referendum, uh, the debate and discussion around it, is all in your paper that you read this morning, and I thought it was terrific and really inspiring. And I, you know, maybe you might come to London and join Professor Hickman, and we do a, a major campaign. Yeah. Um, finally, I, I just wanted to say, um, you know, we have to have a unity of purpose around this. We, we, the community. Uh, the, the Irish abroad, we really do have to have a sense of community around it and, and, and really go for it. As Philly said, we have one shot. Um, and my final point I'd make is that we didn't always cherish the people and the children of this nation equally. We didn't do it for many, many generations of Irish people. We have a chance now to put that right and to really genuinely cherish all the people of our nation equally. Thank you. I'll just take Minister Dennis J. Buckley, Irish and Europe Association, Brussels. First of all, in wearing my cork hat, I wish to assure you that we would have no difficulty in working with you and giving you a hard time as a cork Taoiseach. <laughs> and, in so, and in so saying, no problem working with rotating Taoiseach from the same constituency. <laughs> However, I, first of all, on behalf of the Irish and Europe Association, we welcome the first step announced by the Taoiseach in giving a vote for the presidential elections. However, like Michael Collins, we see this as a stepping stone. In the Articles of Association enshrined in the Irish and Europe Association, our clear campaign is votes for President, Dáil elections and the right to vote in referendum. For, for Irish citizens who were born or lived in Ireland, However, we're open to the concept of broadening the constituency for the presidential elections, but that is our strategy and that is our policy. Now you as a minister, and I want to say this publicly and commend you, this minister within three days of being appointed minister had a council meeting with the Council of Agriculture. He was 12 minutes in a hotel in Brussels where we had our festival club and we heard that he was on site. And we didn't ask him, invite him to speak at, a, at an audience. We volunteered him. And he was engaged uh, automatically, engaging with Irish diaspora and Irish culture. And he has been involved ever since. Now, it I want to put this point across. It was our primary purpose as an Irish and Europe Association to campaign for voting rights. And you speak about the generosity of the Irish people. Well, I'm going to tell you about the, the generosity of the Irish diaspora in Europe. We felt, due to the bailout emergency, that the priority had to be to look after the Irish economy and the people who were at home. And from 2011, Irish volunteers, volunteers and other nationalities from all over the world joined in our campaign to support Ireland and Europe. We had 1.2 million persons who viewed Irish exhibitions promoting Ireland as a destination to live and work. This was to work without a contribution, one financial contribution from the Irish government. They had no money. We did our duty and we showed what we did for Ireland. However, some things have happened recently. The Brexit has changed this whole debate. Why? 250,000 Irish citizens live in Europe. We are worried. Why are we worried? We saw what happened with Brexit in the UK, where all the citizens living abroad had no right to vote in the UK. 
The Conservative government said they're going to extend the right from 15 years to any, any age group. If it was all expats, British expats, Britain now would not be leaving the European Union. We, if there's a referendum in Ireland, we're not saying that Ireland would vote to leave the EU, but because the way politics is in Ireland, it could be a condition of a minority party with the hardships that may come from Brexit, they'll demand a vote and membership of the European Union. We would have no right to a say in holding on to our EU benefits and a right to reside in Europe. The other point is there's an urgency in this discussion. We see this debate on presidential elections as the basis of creating the infrastructure, not only for presidential elections, but for dual elections. We will work in parallel to achieve our objective to have something done for dual elections by the 100th anniversary of the convening of the first dual in the mansion house. I was at the Dublin Little Museum last night. I wanted to enshrine up in that wall in 100 years time in that museum what was done here today for Irish emigrants. The other point is we have to be clever in Brexit negotiations. Sorry, Dennis, so, this is a very important very point. One more point. It's a very yeah. realistic point. If you can act fast, you have a legal basis, number one, in giving Irish emigrants a vote and Irish citizens in Northern Ireland a vote. You have a legal basis to do something for Northern Ireland and Europe, there are three seats allocated to Northern Ireland, the European Parliament. If you get your referendum in place, we can go to the European Commission and say, those three, those three seats in Northern Ireland should be reserved now for an Irish diaspora constituency for all the Irish citizens living in the European Economic Union and the European Association. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. We're going to have, we the, have to, we have to, okay, sorry, thank you. we have and, to wrap and, it there. And this would um, give us the basis. Sorry, we have to. <laughs> um, I, I feel spectacularly as, a, uh, spectacularly as a moderator, I fail to get around to the other issues such as logistics um, and operations, um, but um, you can just see from the passion in the room and the contributions um, just how significant a debate um, this is. What I'm going to do before I invite um, the Minister to uh, close remarks, he sat very, very quietly uh, throughout it all. Um, um, I, I suppose maybe just uh, to, wrap, to, to, to sum up some of the issues um, is that I think, uh, Minister Coveney, it is critical to get the right option before you go to the electorate. It's going to be critical uh, for you, Billy, uh, to have a unity um, of purpose. Issues that are going to be primarily of concern are going to be the potential size of the electorate. I think that can be addressed. I think the, the fear of swamping can be addressed with some, some evidential issue. The issue of genuine connection, connection and the manner in which we assert um, our citizenship for residents outside of the state, I think are some of the key draws that I've taken from them. Um, but I'm going to go back to where we started um, to Isolt um, to look for a show of hands. And Isolt very, very uh, kindly put it together for us in three categories, all citizens, all emigrants, and all emigrants with time limits. Because I know where it's going to go, I'm going to do it in reverse order. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with option three, all emigrants with time limits, a show of hands for that option. Just the one. Uh, option two, all emigrants. And there's a few. Go, go to the third one, which is all citizens. And it's been overwhelmingly carried. Um, on behalf of myself, it's been an honour to be here um, this morning. I, I'll, I'll hand it over to two of the ministers for the brief words, but um, I, I'll hand it over. But what I will just say is that I, I really look forward to this debate happening. And um, in future, I may be a little bit more careful about the way I dress. But if I can convince someone <laughs> in less than 10 minutes, hopefully we can convince others too. So thank you. Uh, Minister Coveney. Yeah, uh, I know. Um, um, I know that Joe's going to sum up, but can I just make a few comments? Uh, that vote's no surprise. Uh, 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 that's the first thing, uh, of course. The sense I'm getting from people is that you don't want timelines uh, in terms of excluding people. I, 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 I think that point. Um, so in other words, you, know, you don't want 15 or 20 or 18 or 17 or 12 years because that creates, that creates lines in the sand whereby people who will be on the other side of that line will feel very aggrieved, understandably. So I'm getting that message very clearly. Um, do people accept, though, that... Uh, I, I didn't really get a response on the passport issue, um, but I, I, I 
what, I, what we're trying to do, and we will take on board the views here around timelines. I think that is age and timelines uh, and whether somebody was born in Ireland or not. I take those points and be, they were made very strongly. Um, the, um, uh, but we, we will also look at some of the other things that people have raised in relation to trying to reinforce con uh, concerns or questions that people may have around connectivity with Ireland. Uh, I think the passport one is an interesting one, but I, I'm, I, I, I think we need to fully explore the consequences of that decision if we were to require, like, because don't forget, a passport is not an identity document. It's actually a travel document, legally. Um, um, and so it, it, if we use it for something that is more than it was intended for, there may be unintended consequences. Uh, and we need to be aware of those and fully tease through them before we would make a decision like that. But I do think a passport is certainly an indicator that somebody wants to hold on to an Irish identity and a connection with a country. Uh, and that, I think, can be, can be quite a powerful um, uh, argument when we're, when we're making this argument uh, to the country. So, uh, look, I just want to thank people. Good to hear Dennis. I haven't spoken to you for a while. Uh, passionate cork man. Uh, and um, it, it, the, the um, uh, and you know, talks in a, an awful lot of sense in the context of uh, of his experiences in Europe. Um, but look, I've got some good messages today. I think it'll help us uh, to put uh, recommendations to government together. But if people want to contact me or my office directly, could I just ask Rena to stand up? Um, she, Rena is 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 the expert that I'm essentially the mouthpiece for. Uh, um, she wrote the options paper. Uh, along with others in the department, and she really is an expert on all things around uh, electoral law and franchising and so on. Uh, and, and so if you have comment, either written or verbal, make contact with us, uh, and we will give a little bit of time now, between now and when I bring recommendations to government, to allow for that process to continue. So thank you very much, and I'll hand over to Joe. And, and for the last word, uh, just a warm welcome to Minister McHugh to, to close this session. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Deirdre. Thanks, Cecil. Thanks, Simon and uh, Billy. Uh, as you know, I'm a Donegal man. I think the re and the reason why I wasn't really participating is because uh, Donegal uh, has a history of uh, uh, consistency in ref all referenda where we consistently vote no. Uh, so maybe that was the reason why you left me on the fringes. But to uh, Father Brendan McBride and Michael McMahon that's down there who remain quite as well, I think uh, we have enough connections globally uh, to be big, a big part of this referendum and also to reach out uh, to our Donegal, people living in Donegal, uh, to make this happen. Uh, I I want to acknowledge uh, the people that have, been, that, that have brought this session together. Simon has mentioned his own officials. I want to mention my officials as well. But can I just say to the intervention there by the Scouser, I think everybody with the Scouser accent should get a vote irrespective or whatever. <laughs> uh, Sally Mulready uh, sort of uh, crystallised what we have to do. We have to show resolve both globally, internationally and locally to get this across the line. Um, and look, Sally, you're right, there are different opinions within individual parties, within our own party. People feel strongly about it. So, But look, that's democracy where people have different opinions, but we have a role to try to bring people with us. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for your intervention on that. Can I just say, following from a theme last night, look, this is a global leadership issue. Um, and I've had the tremendous and uh, privileged insight uh, in the last uh, year to be with President Higgins at a number of events. Uh, you, you will see it in your own respective communities. You have seen it. You know the importance of it. But within 48 hours of being appointed Minister for Diaspora and International Development, this week last year, I had to go to Istanbul to the World Humanitarian Summit. And the impact that President Higgins made at that summit, not just to Irish people and with Irish people at different levels there, but on the international stage, the impact in terms of global leadership on development and humanitarian work, he was the person that people were looking to. And that sort of beacon of hope is something that I've uh, seen. I've seen it in Edinburgh, where one day he was speaking to uh, graduates from Edinburgh University, and look, we're very lucky to have a president of the calibre of uh, Michael D. Higgins. He was speaking to them as an academic. The following day, he was in the Scottish Parliament. He was speaking not just as an Irish leader, but also in terms of global leadership. And when 
the wonderful experience of the first ever head of state to go to the United Kingdom in 2014 when President Higgins was there. I was in Guildhall and yes, it was all uh, very high level and we were all there and including uh, Martin McGuinness, God rest him. I, I spoke to him before the event in the Guildhall in London. But I think the biggest impact that President Higgins made on that wonderful trip, I think it was in Coventry, if I'm not uh, being uh, rude uh, or not to slight any other communities, but from speaking to people from Coventry last night, Coventry was a big impact, but that was worth the Irish diaspora in Coventry. I think there was a lot of impact around that, and uh, that impact that the President has is so, so important. But yesterday, the President was in Ballyfermot. He was in Ballyfermot, and on Twitter, who was acknowledging his speech uh, in Ballyfermot. It was a, a parishioner of my own uh, from Downings in County Donegal, Deglan McFadgen, but he's living in Singapore. So there you had a member of the diaspora acknowledging what our president, and was listening to what our president was saying in relation to his message around bullying uh, and the issues around uh, pressures for teenagers and all that. But you are listening to everything what our, to, to what our president is saying, and you want to be part of that in terms of the, of the um, uh, of, of the, the franchise. And I know Hammersmith community is trying to get the president to go to do the official opening in the Irish Cultural Centre, so I'll give you a plug for that to try and fast track that. Um, but uh, Conrad made a very, very important point there. Like, you know, what can we do collectively? And I want to finish on this point here. You have a role. You know what the office of the president does in your communities when the president comes, be it Mary Robinson in the past, Mary McAleese and President Michael D. Higgins. You know the impact, you know the thread, and it's important that we create an opportunity after this event, after all the words are spoken, that we have a, a conduit or a mechanism where you can be part of the debate. You won't have a vote. As Conrad rightly pointed out, it will be the Republic of Ireland uh, uh, people on the register that will have a vote, but you will have a say in the debate, and it's important we provide that medium, medium to articulate your voice. Because you also have leverage. And to use one example, in 2011, when this country was under pressure, when this country was under serious pressure economically, the Canadian government announced 10,000 visas for Irish citizens, young people, to go to work in Canada. Many from my own county. That just didn't happen. That wasn't just a Canadian politician standing up, signing a document. There was leverage. It was the influence of the Irish people, the Irish Canadian people living in Canada that influenced that decision, that made it easier for us at that time. And they're the type of impacts that we have to acknowledge. I would like to uh, finish by saying, by you articulating the value of having a president, irrespective of where you live on the international stage, that is going to be so important. Billy's correctly pointed out, this is not going to be easily won. This referendum is not going to be easily won. There is the whole issue of swamping. Uh, Dervla has pointed that out from our massive intensive research this morning. <laughs> in the, um, uh, some consultancy company is going to get probably paid 10,000 euro for that big research piece that uh, uh, Dervla did this morning in, in the taxi. But we have a job. We have a job to be honest, and from speaking to Isolde the last night and today, we have to be honest about this debate. We have to be honest that it's not going to be easily won, but with all the connections, with all the, lever all the relevance, with all the leverage, I think we can do this. I believe we can do it. As Simon has pointed out, we have a duty to do it as well in terms of the change in international landscape, the change in role of us as a country in, in, in the international uh, sphere, and that will be included in the changing uh, nature of our Irish diaspora policy as we continue to, to review it. So, go a mila mila maig of a lig, bo aile mo ahanda zarish agol chig na dinia of a partial as an chodol in you, agus an session sha faste, agus go gi dervla, agus na dinia lig of a earn panel, don fear beach, as fear beach as an chora jerfa, agus go a mila mila maig of a rish. Thank you very much. Thank you.